Hello everyone, Outer Galaxy Lounge Man here. We're standing before the exalted altar of the Outer Galaxy Lounge Film Book Reference Library. These are film guides that date all the way back to the 1920s, although many of them are reprints, up through about the mid-2000s. This is generally the era in which, if they were available at all, the only way that you could find out about movies was from books. Uh, once the Internet Movie Database and other sites like that got going, these became somewhat superfluous. However, we're going to talk about guides from time to time, periodically, maybe trace the history of them. I'm going to talk about one in particular right now. I alluded to it a little bit in my last uh, video. If you want to see my video on the worst film book ever written, that video would be that one. It's rather longish, and I'm sorry for that. It wasn't scripted. Neither will this one be. I tried to write a script, but I ended up making it too damn long. So let's just go with this. So I was in Half Price Books the other day, and I found this beauty right here. Hallowell's Film Guide, written by Leslie Hallowell. This is the 7th edition. It, uh, this was published in 1989. Now, this is not the first guide. There was a long string of Hallowell's Film Guides that were published roughly from 1977 to probably the mid-2000s, I'm guessing. I don't know when the last one was done, but it's a long story. Leslie Hallowell, in short, was a British film buff, film critic, who grew up in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, who started his career in the 50s as a programmer. He ran a cinema in Britain at Cambridge. He became a major television programmer for, for networks like uh, ITV and Granada Television. He bought films. He went to Hollywood and, and did film purchases and brought them back to Britain. He staged retrospectives, ran film programs, wrote a ton of books about movies. He was kind of a big deal in Britain, and his film guides generally are considered to be the first of their kind ever, although... If we really get deep in the history of cinema, we'll see that there were sort of film guides prior to him, but nothing quite like this. The first one that he did, and let me backtrack a little bit. He actually wrote his first film guide of sorts, or encyclopedia, in 1965, and it was called The Film Goer's Companion. Now, this is an, a much later edition, the 12th edition. This one's in great shape. Uh, this was his first film guide. But it's not the same as his film guide, okay? This is more of an encyclopedia of sorts. It covers not just uh, film titles, but film personalities. This is essentially devoted to, you know, directors and stars. And maybe some concepts in movies. Uh, my dad used to actually use an earlier edition of this to do crossword puzzles. And he tore that thing the hell up. That's a long in the garbage I was able to replace it with this one, which, honestly, I don't refer to this very much. But this, this is just for context. This was his first guide in 65, and it continued to be published for the next, I guess, what, 30 years maybe? In 77, he came out with this film guide, though. This is a different animal. This is the guide to film titles, and he would rate them and write little capsule reviews of the films. Now, this first edition from 77... This is torn up all the hell. Look, the dust jacket cover is messed up. I kept it, though, just so you can catch the flavor of what it looked like. This one had 8,000 titles in it. By the time this one from 89 came out, and then this later one that was edited by John Walker after Hallowell had died uh, came out, we're starting to get up into the 20, 25,000 title range, especially in this one. So the capacity of the book went up like my maybe four times I think in the number of titles that were covered so anyway so what's the big deal with Hollowell well for a certain generation of people my generation obviously I would be classified as a boomer and my film tastes were formed in the 60s 70s and 80s when I was young as a child and then through my young man days in the 80s when I was starting a career and really ramping up my interest in cinema my real interest in cinema started probably around 1978, around the time I bought this. And that's a long story. The way that we used to watch movies was a lot different. The kind of variety that we had was different. The way movies were distributed and seen were different. 
that's a vastly different story that I'd like to tell in a different video, maybe something more comprehensive. Right now we're going to stick to the Hallowell Film Guide, okay? So Leslie Hallowell, just to give you the Wikipedia rundown, was born 1929 in England. He died in 1989. So he didn't live a very long life, but he suffused his life in movies, which is probably not a good thing for the vast majority of the rest of us, unless you're going to make a career out of it. It can be a time-consuming rabbit hole, and you'll never know everything you need to know to be a really good film expert. But I've tried, and this library reflects that to some extent, and I have read at least part of every single book in there, you know, as needed, as I need to refer to things for whatever project I might be working on, or whatever knowledge I'm trying to glean. Even today, with things like the Internet Movie Database, I still find these valuable. Uh, today, it's very difficult, I think, for younger people to be film buffs, because there's just so much of a larger selection of films to choose from, and now you can literally access every movie ever made, which is something we couldn't do in the past. What was great about these this era was that there was a certain limitation to what we could see and a certain limitation of what we could find out about movies. So guides like this were much more important, relatively speaking. This is a really beautiful edition, and I almost passed on this because my shelf space issues. And also because, you know, let's be honest, this is kind of redundant with the amount of information we can get today. But this was too beautiful. It, I, I mean, it's practically in mint condition. You hardly ever see an old film guide, especially a good one like this, in a condition like this. With this dust jacket looking brand new, the gloss is brand new, the color, and the interior is just mint. Beautiful condition. And it kind of... Uh, replaces this old copy. Now, I would probably still refer to this copy. A number of things happened to the guide in the years between this 77 edition and this 89 edition. Hallowell's guide got bigger, for one thing, and he started covering foreign films in this. This early edition is primarily and pretty much exclusively devoted to English language movies made in Hollywood and Britain. So, this one he expands into foreign and German films and some Japanese films and other countries. And in any case, the ratings between this edition and this edition didn't change. Hallowell never changed his mind, which can be a good or a bad thing, depending. A lot of people admired him for his uh, sticking to his guns as far as his opinion and not being terribly excited about newer films. By newer films, I mean 60s, 70s, and 80s when he was alive. However, he did die in 1989, and then after that, a guy named John Walker began to edit the book. And I think this is one of the last editions. This is 2004. I'm not sure when they stopped publication. But in any case, paper, paper guides like this aren't really printed anymore. The famous Malton Guide, I believe, has ceased publication as well. A lot of the problems uh, of film going today, as I've mentioned, stem partly from the fact that you've got so many choices and so many ways of getting hold of movies. You can stream them, you can get them on different physical media, and the variety of what's available from international sources is now something that never existed before. You can get obscure movies from every country on earth now that you just could not get or see back in the day, back when books like this were out, where most of the movies were Hollywood and British centric or maybe just Eurocentric. So how do people form tastes now in movies? A lot of their tastes come from places like Netflix where the algorithm helps guide them, which is a terrible way to learn about movies because the algorithm is going to tend to lead you to a dumber path. It's going to dumb down to the lowest common denominator content. They're interested in mass marketing. They don't want to lead you off to more intellectual, intelligent, or challenging fare. No, they, they're interested in the opposite. So the beautiful thing about this era was that you have one person's opinion. You watch the films that they watch, and then you come up with your own opinion. They can guide you. These people, in a sense, were an algorithm, but they're too individual to be considered an algorithm. They are a person with their own opinion. And that's a quirky thing. That is not algorithmically driven. 
So Hallowell, in a sense, is a, a curated gatekeeper guide to lead us down the path, at least in the sense of showing us what movies he liked and why. Over time, you can continue to agree with him, or you can change your tastes, which is something you should do because he was limited. His dismissal of newer films is problematic. He didn't tend to like movies made after 1960 for the most part. Almost no movies made after about 1960 got four stars in his guides. I think the, old, the last movie that he gave four stars to in one of his guides was maybe Bonnie and Clyde in 67. I don't know if that changed in the newer guide. That's where John Walker kind of stepped in when he became editor, and he began to dicker around a little bit with Hallowell's ratings. Now, some people who were big Hallowell nuts hated that. They didn't like that John Walker dared and had the temerity to have his own opinion, because after all, the book is called Hallowell's Guide. Why would you change anything? Well, of course, Hallowell couldn't see certain movies after a certain time because he was deceased, but Walker did change ratings that Hallowell had given to films. And there are some interesting instances of Walker upgrading some films that we have since regarded much more highly than Hallowell would have at the time. Uh, being there, the Hal Ashby film starring Peter Sellers, for instance, I think either got zero or two stars in Hallowell's original assessment, but Walker upgraded it to four stars. Uh, a movie called Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, which came out around 1980. I think that was an Australian movie. Hallowell didn't like it. He gave it zero stars. Walker upgraded that to four stars. Uh, Southern Comfort, the Walter Hill movie, either got, I can't remember, zero or two stars in the original Hallowell book. And it was upgraded to four by Walker. Uh, a number of films that had gotten three stars, uh, like The Godfather, Cabaret, and Wild Bunch, were upgraded to four stars under Walker. Uh, movies like The Hustler, Bridge on the River Kwai, Picnic at Hanging Rock, and Network, which had gotten either two or three stars, were upgraded to four stars in Walker's edition here, and the other Walker editions. And again, the Hallowell Nuts hated that. They wanted uh, Hallowell's original opinion to stand. Well... Walker understood, as I understand, that opinions change and assessments and consensus changes among critics about the value of certain movies. There's hardly anybody back in the day who would consider Vertigo to be one of the greatest movies ever made, and yet on the international polls now, it is at the top of the greatest movies ever made poll, the Sight and Sound poll, for instance. And the editions of the book reflect this. Here's the set, 1977, Hallowell rating for Vertigo, two stars, 1958. This is not out of line with what most critics in the 50s or 60s would have given Vertigo. It was not considered one of Hitchcock's greatest movies yet. That had to come with time, with critical reassessment. And before I go further talking about Hallowell's ratings, let me make sure you understand what a rating means in Hallowell's book versus what it means in other guides, okay? For most guides, a three and four star movie is pretty much at the top echelon. Well, of course, that's the case here too, but his is much more relative. What I really mean to say is that a star in a Hallowell book carries much more weight, okay? So, if he gives something two stars, that's usually a movie that gets three, three and a half, or four stars in any other guide because his stars carry greater weight relatively. Uh, any movie that gets a star is worth watching, okay? So a, a one star in Hallowell would equate to three stars in any other guide. Let, uh, consider it uh, like con trying to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius or or converting a uh, British pound to U.S. dollars, there's going to be a different value. I mean, that's not quite a germane uh, comparison, but the point of the matter is, is when you look at a Hallowell rating, you have to upgrade it a little bit from what he's saying, because a two-star film is a very, very good film by his standard. That's a film that he recommends, like two stars equals four stars in any other rating. So always remember that when you're looking at Hallowell. The, the stars carry greater weight, okay? When you're getting to a three-star film, you're practically at masterpiece level, and four stars is just off the chart, okay? 
So most of the movies in his guide get one star or no stars. Uh, and he even has some good things to say about one star movies. One star just means routine. You know, it can mean poor, but it can just also mean routine or mediocre or just slightly above average. Uh, a movie with one star has some things worth seeing in it. Two stars means it's probably a movie you ought to see. It's a significant movie. Three stars and four stars are definitely movies you need to see. So that's how Hallowell rates things. You got to just look at it. His weights, his weights on stars on asterisks are much higher. To keep up with the times, uh, Walker in his later editions in the 90s and 2000s upgraded a whole lot of movies, some of which I just mentioned. He may have downgraded some, but I can't find any downgrades. I was trying to look for some in here, but I couldn't find any. I think he pretty much remained true to Hallowell's opinions as far as not downgrading, but he did upgrade a lot of stuff. And that's because, and let's be honest, and more contemporary film goers have reassessed a lot of movies that were not once classics up to classic status now, and that in many cases is justified. Anyone criticizing Walker for upgrading these is probably misguided. I understand why they would do it, because after all, it's Hallowell's film guide. How dare this guy upgrade Hallowell's ratings? In some cases, I agree with Hallowell's original estimate, but in many of the cases, I agree with John Walker's upgrades. I think it's interesting that uh, Walker, in his own way, uh, was just as quirky as Hallowell was. And let's be honest, Hallowell was quirky and he had his limitations. Hallowell's grand era of the movies, by his standard, was the 30s and 40s, the golden age of Hollywood. And I sympathize with them because those are the movies I grew up with and I think they're the great foundational classics and they ought to be seen. I think it's funny that in Hollowell's original film guides, not this one, this one, uh, to this one, where this one is Hallowell himself giving the opinion, and this is one where uh, Walker upgrades the opinion or the rating, that Walker had a certain affinity for the director Walter Hill, for instance, that Hallowell didn't have. I don't think Hallowell gave a damn about Walter Hill, per se, but Walker likes him. In fact, in the earlier guide by Hallowell, uh, Southern Comfort and the film The Driver that, w that Hill made in 1978, which I think is a great film that Hallowell didn't think was so great. I think he either gave it zero, zero or one star, not very much. Uh, Walker upgraded that movie to four stars, the very top rating, and I have to agree with Walker. I think The Driver deserves four stars. I think it's a masterpiece. It's a beautiful L.A. noir, update of noir with a car chase motif and just beautifully done all the way around a beautiful vibe to that movie and to me it's a classic but that movie was not in Hallowell's wheelhouse it wasn't his part of his sensibility so what are we to make of a hybrid version of a book that's supposed to stay true to the spirit and opinion of the original guy who had a very distinct opinion and set of opinions to a new guy who has to do two things. Balance this original opinion set with his own. Because he's going to be seeing movies that this guy could not have seen, of course. But then again, he also has to keep in mind and take into account that movies that Hallowell disliked or liked may be reassessed in light of new opinions, and new sensibilities and a new zeitgeist in the way that we look at movies now. I want to read you something that somebody said about Hallowell. As much as I like him, he is limiting. Uh, I think people saying that if you deviate from Hallowell, you're dumbing down your cinema opinions, I think is nonsense. You have to evolve, okay? If you're not evolving, you're going to really be an angry old man telling kids to get off your lawn, right? So let me, I want to read something I got out of the Wikipedia article because no matter how well your video is, no matter how slick it is or, or how, how not slick it is, like this one where I'm just talking to a camera, everybody uses Wikipedia. Don't fool yourself. So Hallowell had his critics and I agree with the critics, but I still love Hallowell's guide and I still appreciate and understand his opinions. 
I take everything into account when I form an opinion. Of course, the biggest determinant of how I rate a film is based on my own viewing of it and my own understanding of the context of all other films made around it before and after and during the time it was made. Many different factors come into it. But I want to read you something from Wikipedia about some of the dissident opinions to Hallowell's expertise or opinions, okay? In addition to receiving much praise for his work, Hallowell came under fire from journalists and critics for his laconic comments and dismissive stance on more recent films. That's true. He was very harsh on recent films for a number of reasons. Uh, his devotion to the golden age of Hollywood left him increasingly out of touch with modern attitudes. That's true. Longtime observer, film critic Philip French wrote that Hollowell, quote, isn't a scholar, critic, or cineast, but rather a movie buff, a man who knows the credits of everything but the value of very little. Uh, that's going a little too far, but I know what he means. Uh, so here's Jim Emerson of the Orange County Register called Hallowell, quote, something of a grumpy old English fuddy-duddy who rarely has anything good to say about any movie made after 1960, and that is true, too. Before I talk any more about the Hallowell Film Guide, and I'm about to wrap it up here. Now, this was the first Hallowell Film Guide of sorts, the Filmgoer's Companion, that encyclopedia I mentioned before. It was sort of uh, published concurrently with these other film guides. These rated titles and gave reviews, and these were largely bibliography or bibliographical material about stars, directors, and maybe some film concepts and stuff. Now, this book, which was first published in 65 and then continuously published for a while, over several decades, was superseded by this. This is Ephraim Katz's film encyclopedia. I also have an earlier edition of this. This is a later edition of this. This is a massive ass thing. Uh, this is much more complete than Hallowell's Filmgoer's Companion ever was. My dad used to use an earlier di edition of this to do his crossword puzzles, and that got torn up, and that one's long gone. I replaced it with this one. Uh, but the film. Encyclopedia by Ephraim Katz. I think this is one that Roger Ebert actually referred to a lot when he was doing his film research. This has also, of course, been superseded by the internet, and I never honestly used this one very much because most of the concepts that are covered in here are covered in other books. This was just a nice one-volume guide if you wanted to look up, you know, what's film noir or what's a an aspect ratio, or what's a celluloid, or what's a gaffer, or what's a, what are the great movies of Japanese cinema. This is kind of a one-stop shop for movie facts, right? Not just trivia, I mean important technical and bibliographical detail are in this, okay? So Hallowell's Film Guide came from a guy who adored the classic golden age of Hollywood cinema and who liked some uh, foreign movies. Now, in this first edition of Hallowell's Film Guide from 1977-78, he had this kind of now infamous <laughs> essay called The Decline and Fall of the Movie. And in fact, I actually referred to this quite a bit when I wrote an essay in college about why I didn't like newer movies and liked older movies. I really heavily relied on this. Unfortunately, this is a bunch of horse crap now. Uh, this opinion is so st stuck in the mud it's it, And it's even senseless at times, if you really dig into it. He was arguing things like uh, widescreen movies weren't that good because movies should be filmed in like 4 to 3 Academy ratio. Like 4 to 3 was a much better way to make movies than, you know, CinemaScope or whatever. Well, you know, yeah, CinemaScope can be used badly, and I've seen many instances of it. It can also be used beautifully. The Japanese were very good at using widescreen, much better than Americans, honestly. But things like that, to say that modern movies weren't as good, were kind of beside the point. I think he was just being nitpicky. But, yeah, he didn't have a lot to say about new movies, and some of the reasons he cites for new movies not being as good, and by new again, I, I mean the 60s and 70s, are actually some of the strong suits of new movies. Yes, the permissiveness of new movies is actually a good thing. 
The ability to do things that you couldn't do before is actually a good thing. Can you rely on those things too much? Of course. Sometimes the limitations of past movies, censorship and such as that, required uh, filmmakers to be very clever, especially in comedy. And that's why a lot of the great comedies of the past are still the best comedies ever made, because they had to be much wittier and not rely on, you know, the more obvious things like fart jokes or whatever will get an instant laugh from people. So, anyway, now let's look at the 1989 edition. I bought this for uh, $6.99, which is pretty nice. So let me look at the opening page here. I want to show you what's in this 7th edition. Uh, this was published uh, right as Hallowell had just, had died, actually. So this was the last one he did under his own editorship. Uh, it's interesting that he includes the publisher's notes and preferences to the 7th, 6th, 5th, and 4th editions. So if you didn't have those editions, you still get to read what his thoughts were from those earlier editions, which is kind of nice. And then he has his uh, list of alternative titles and then the various translated titles from foreign films. Because foreign films, of course, in some cases will have multiple different titles. And, uh, you know, we call La Strada La Strada. We don't call it The Road, but I'm sure he carries both on here so that you know that. And explanatory notes. Not sure what that is. And then the film guide, which, of course, is the bulk of the book, A to Z. And then he's got some other things. And he's got the... Decline and Fall of the Movie, reprinted in here. So his original 1977 essay is still showing up in the 1989 edition, which I find interesting. I don't know if he altered it at all in here. I haven't read this edition's version of that essay. If it's the same, it's the same bunk as the original one. It's not thoroughly dismissible, but what it gives us is the opinion of a grumpy old dude who didn't evolve. And that's okay. I understand how he did and didn't evolve. As long as I understand that and appreciate his opinions when I consider them to be good opinions, which I do in most cases. His opinions, as far as most old films, are dead on. But again, there's a lot of films and filmmakers that we since have come to regard highly and usually justifiably that Hallowell didn't get, did not understand, and didn't appreciate properly. And that's okay. Now, if you want to know more about Leslie Hallowell and his guide, there is a website, and I think it's called LeslieHallowell.com. And, of course, the people running that website love Leslie Hallowell. He can do no wrong. So take that website with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of valuable information, especially if you are already familiar with this guide like I am. And if you like it like I do, I like Hallowell and his guide. I would not only go by Hallowell's opinion, though. Is this a really good guide? to films of the 30s, 40s, and 50s? In general, yes. When he gives a film four stars, it usually deserves it. There's one film in here that probably doesn't deserve it, but I understand why he gave it four stars, and that's The Jazz Singer from 1927 with Al Jolson. Interestingly enough, Walker kept that rating in the 2004 edition. It's still the original Jazz Singer from 1927 with Al Jolson still has four stars in this edition. I saw the, ja the jazz singer in a theater, in an old theater back in the 80s on the big screen and watching it in that context, knowing what I know about history, American history, the history of media and the history of movies and the history of silent movies and the history of talking pictures and the his social history of America, watching that movie on a big screen in that setting and knowing all this, I could feel the magic of that movie. I could feel why someone back then would have found that movie a revelation. And I think Hallowell is trying to convey that feeling, why that was a monumental thing in 1927, and why that's historically very important, and why that would merit this film getting a four star, even though aesthetically and entertaining wise, you know, maybe it at best should be given two stars. And, of course, the blackface elements of Al Jolson's shtick back then would be problematic. Now, I don't know how much of that he did in The Jazz Singer. I can't remember. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. But I think things have to be considered in historical context. And we can't lose our shit at everything that doesn't jibe with our present perceptions, okay? We do have to take a lot of things into account when we're looking at movies. 
And no, maybe we wouldn't watch the jazz singer in mixed company. Probably not a good idea. But in any case, that gets us off into another large discussion of aesthetics and social change and so forth that we're not going to do now. So, so there's three Hallowell's film guides. The original 77, which has 8,000. This one, which has a lot more from 1989 and is in beautiful condition. And this 2004 John Walker edited edition, which has 23,000 titles in it. If I were to recommend any of these, if you came across these, which one would I tell you to get? Well, you're not me, and you didn't grow up in an era where books like this might have been more necessary. So maybe you don't need any of them. But honestly, the Walker one here is probably the best one. It has the most stuff in it. It's more up to date with contemporary opinion. You know, he talks about filmmakers that you're going to be more familiar with too, like Spielberg and people like that. And in the main, his opinions stick to Hallowell's original opinions. Not always though. So Walker is kind of in a no-win situation here. He has to please the Hallowellites who are going to want the opinions to remain the same. But he also has to please the newer audiences who are going to expect uh, more contemporary films to be more respected and also to follow his own muse as to what he wants to rate things. So a hybrid like this is a no-win situation. People who don't like Hallowell's uh, supposedly stuffy original opinions won't like it. People who don't like him upgrading Hallowell's opinions won't like it. And people who don't like Walker's opinions at all won't like it. Not sure what you do when you're put in this position. He has, he has to edit a viable commercial product, which is this book, for a contemporary audience, still re remain true to a certain aesthetic standard, one of them being Hallowell himself, and one of them being Walker's own opinion, because he's a knowledgeable film buff himself. What do you do? Maybe that's one reason this book should not exist anymore, which of course it doesn't. But in any case, it's interesting food for thought. What do you do when you take over a beloved property from someone else, have to put your own stamp on it, and juggle a number of different factors? It depends on how much of a parlor game you want to make out of all this. I love this 1989 edition. I just love the condition of it. And it does have a lot more stuff, especially foreign movies. This one didn't. This has a lot more, and this has even more still. So, so there you go. That's a little bit of an overview of some Hallowell's film guides. If there's something I missed, please say something about it in the comments. If you want to take me on, argue with me, tell me I'm full of shit, whatever you want to say, you're welcome to do so. Thank you very much.